very good afternoon to all of you ladies and gentlemen. It's actually one of the most difficult sessions to address, the session after lunch. And somehow the Express guys thought that I'm the one who should be challenged with this issue. And so I have the privilege of being here today post-lunch and be a part of this tech sabha organized by the Indian Express group. When Carl Benz invented the automobile in 1885, little would he have known that in 135 years, it will turn out to be the ultimate disruptor of humans' lives and the civic way of life. Undoubtedly, it gave us extraordinary new freedom to travel great distances and to get around like never before. It spawned new industries, thousands of new companies, and drove generations of personal and economic growth. Yet, over time, our towns and cities were getting designed around the automobile, and roads had taken precedence over lakes and gardens. Where people once gathered in the streets, there are now highways and multi-lane roads. The freedom to move is leading towards a world where roads are being built for cars. Worst of all, time we used to spend with each other is now often wasted in congestion and traffic. Many of us have also experienced bad throat and issues relating to breathing in many of our cities. And many a times, it's because the air quality index of those cities is so bad that it is not fit for human habitation. This is also one of the challenges of the mobility that humans are trying to actually expand, make more efficient, make more secure, and yet sometimes not so sustainable. I must tell you that I'm happy that today and even yesterday when I was flying into Jaipur, the air quality index was good. And normally, if I go to a city, because I've become senior enough, I see the air quality index, and if it is very bad, I tend to send somebody else. Now, that's not safe for that guy, but that's the kind of thought that goes into my mind, and I'm sure most of us very soon will actually be thinking the same. So in this session, we should endeavor to deliberate upon some answers to the problem, as I would kind of lay out before you, and look at a sustainable mobility plan, which is based on a long-term vision for transport and mobility development for the entire human agglomeration, which covers all modes and forms of transport, public and private, passenger and freight, motorized and non-motorized, moving and parking. Now, this whole idea of safe, efficient, sustainable mobility for all is what we all are trying to get to. And here I would like to once again take you to the future as I am perceiving it and want you to imagine a world where none of us would be actually owning cars. And why? Because we would not need to own cars. None of us would be driving cars. And why? Because cars would not need drivers. And none of us would have cars which would emit so much of carbon because a lot of it could be electric. Now, this is not a vision which is some very distant light years away. It's going to happen in one decade. And it's already started happening in some cities in the US. A Couple of years ago, I had gone to California for a training program sponsored by the government of India. And I had this great desire to sit on a Tesla car which was autonomous. So I actually asked a friend of mine to schedule a test drive. And I went to this shop where the Tesla car came on its own in a very spooky way from the parking lot. And I actually didn't know how to get into the car because the car really didn't have a door. And then this guy said that if you just kind of show your hand to the car with the key in your hand, the door will open. And I did that and the doors went up. I walked into the car instead of bending and sitting into the car. And the car drove itself, brought me back. I got out of the car. I said P on my, uh, on my key, and the car went and parked itself. Now just imagine, today we have 3.5 crores cars. I'll be showing you that in the next slide in Maharashtra, which we are currently actually managing. And if 3.5 crore cars were all autonomous, would we really need to have so many of them? Because there would be no drivers required, 
you already have the experience of Ola and Uber. I mean, most of you would have had it. And you know that you can actually get a car at the time of your requirement, at the place that you need it, and it will take you to the point where you want to get off, and therefore you don't have to stand in sun, rain, hail, and storm. And that's one of the reasons why we own cars, that maybe in some emergency we might need to have one, maybe in the night if I need to go to a hospital, I might require, maybe some friend of mine is coming at an unearthly hour to the airport and I may not be able to get a driver, and therefore you own a car. But if you have autonomous cars, they would not need drivers, and so there will be no tired drivers, and the cars would be all the time available to us. This is the future of shared mobility, of sustainable mobility. Tesla, by the way, is also an electric car. And this is the vision that we should all have before we embark upon the technology journey that we are all trying to actually somewhere emulate. However, the slides that I'm going to show you is about the journey that we are actually undertaking. I still believe that we are a few years behind in technology. Technology is already ahead of us. And whatever we, I'm going to show you is what should have happened 20 years ago, but which is still happening, and it's, it's a work in progress in Maharashtra. So we do regulation to ensure safety. We do improvement to public health for sustainability. We want to increase citizen safety. Therefore, we want to have a whole lot of regulation. We want to make our mobility efficient, hence regulate. And then we want to have economic development propelled by the government, and hence revenue collection is one of the other objectives that the Department of Transport normally has. And this should be more or less the objectives of all transport departments in the country. The key statistics, as I just said, that our driving licenses have gone up from 1.77 crores to 3.51 crores, and our vehicle population has gone up from 1.45 crores to 3.55 crores. Now, that's a humongous increase in the vehicle population in a state like Maharashtra. It's about three times in a matter of just 10 years. And if we grow the same way, then I can tell you that there will be very few cities in which people will be able to live. They will be only meant for cars to be parked. Because most often than not, most of you would know that out of 24 hours, 22 hours is, of a car is spent in a parking lot. It could be either on a road or a parking lot, but 22 hours the car is actually not operational. The revenues have gone up, obviously, because the revenues are going up, so we are also okay with registrations. But as I said, we need to have some kind of a cost-benefit trade-off. Now, I move straight on to the e-governance initiatives that we have undertaken. And we've looked at some of the best practices across the world. And based on that, we have looked at what should be the way we should license drivers, what should be the way we should register vehicles, how should permits be determined. And if all vehicles in India become electric, anyway, permits are not required for electric vehicles. So permit column itself will not exist after some time. Because government of India already issued an order that all electric vehicles do not require permits. I mean, right or wrong is a different question, but that's already in place. And then we have this whole idea of checking the safety of vehicles and therefore inspection. And I can tell you one of the jobs that is going to go out very quickly if the vision that I just explained to you happens is that most of these things will not be relevant. In terms of the enterprise architecture, this is the kind of enterprise architecture that we hope to get to, where the front end is such that the citizen doesn't have any interface at all with the government. Even if it's a grievance, it is addressed without interface. The core applications are such that they can back up this whole idea of being citizen friendly so that all the database is well managed, pr protected, secure, and therefore all citizens actually get the benefit of the front end. And other support applications to ensure that within in-house things are transparent, things are efficient, and people are actually performing their tasks. To ensure that supervision is appropriate, create analytics, create dashboards, create various kinds of other things, support systems, so that this whole process is more efficient internally, and then work on smart applications so that anything which actually could go wrong is also checked well on time. So of this, the, the stuff which has just got those green patches, they have already been implemented in the state. And what you see now in orange is what is going to come up 
over the next one year. If you look at the size and scale at which we are operating, 12% of the country's total vehicles are getting registered in Maharashtra. 11% of the country's vehicles are actually country vehicle transactions are happening in Maharashtra. And 92% of the revenue is collected online in Maharashtra as compared to the average of 55% in the rest of the country. And almost about 17.6% of the total licensing is happening in Maharashtra. Now, if you look at Maharashtra's population, it's about 10% of India. So 17.6% is about twice the total size compared to the rest of the country. And these things, they are impacting us in a way in which you can see that we have the fastest rollout of Vahan, Sarathi, which are Government of India uh, IT initiatives. We have done some business process re-engineering of 110 odd services, and I'll just show you that. And 43 of the online services, which take care of 80% of the total transactions that happen in the transport department, have been made online. And the impact that it has created is that it has reduced the man months. It has a savings in terms to the tune of 78 crores. And it has increased a, a daily collection to 25 crores on the e-portal itself. Now, these are the issues that we have done on business process re-engineering, online appointment, online document upload, online payment, standard three-step process, auto approvals, etc. Now, I'm not trying to say here that we have become as efficient as we would have wanted to be. I'm only trying to say that this is just an attempt to become more efficient than what we were. These are some of the other steps that we have taken. Call center is in place. We have tie up with about 25,000 common services centers. Postal delivery of all driving licenses and registration certificates by speed post and an open platform for citizens so that they could upload their own records manually and digitize it for us, <coughs> ensuring thereby that there are no mistakes in the digitization process itself. Some of the other facilitation that we have done for citizen services, as you would see, is this is how it has impacted before and after. And the stuff we have done is that we have done data digitization, as I said, which is manually done by the citizen himself or herself so that the data is more or less clean. It has an Aadhaar authentication along with it, and there are auto approvals where application and printing can be done at home. This, as I just said, is, is a scene of the Pune RTO and uh, shows you that there has been some improvement in the uh, citizen facilitation that we have done. The proposed projects that we have right now is to create a model RTO to create better quality driver regulation because most of the accidents which are happening today is because driver regulation is not really as well as it is in many parts of the world. Enforcement and road safety, vehicle regulation including inspection and certification of vehicles, some policy initiatives like electric vehicles, permit rationalization, vehicle deregistration and scrapping which is just about to come, and some new age technology, which is not new age anymore, but a new age for government, which is artificial intelligence, use of artificial intelligence, blockchain, video analytics, image and processing. I can actually make some more details on, on each one of those points that I've just said here, but given the fact that I have only one and a half minutes left, I would just try to tell you that personally, I feel that a lot of this stuff is going to go out. Uh, in 10 years, and if, it not, if not in 10 years, in 20 years, it, will all, it would all have gone. And therefore, the tech companies which are working very hard on improving the way we are printing the licenses, driving licenses with a chip in, on, inside, in, uh, embedded in it, will all be gone because the chip may not be required. It's already not required. You have a QR code which can be read on a, a smartphone rather than a reader. And therefore, most of this stuff will not be needed. Like Aadhaar card already doesn't need to be printed. It's actually something which is which is always available to you and can be authenticated from any POS machine. Yet, as of today, these are some of the things that we are trying to do. This is internal for the RTO itself, how to make the RTO office a model office. This is the internal efficiency in terms of data analytics that we are doing so that all dashboards are in place and supervision can be appropriately done. As I was telling somebody earlier, that regulation actually needs to have a very good balance between light-handedness and heavy-handedness. If we let regulation run amok, it becomes very heavy-handed, but 
If we don't do it, then everything becomes anarchical. So there has to be a very fine balance uh, as to how much you regulate and how much you don't. And that's why these internal uh, efficiencies are extremely essential. In terms of driver regulation, as most of you who have traveled abroad would know that they actually do a much more serious test of a driver's capability. They do both theoretical as well as vision tests for the drivers. And more than that, they have a whole lot of other additional tests. And a lot of it could be actually done on simulators now. In fact, one of the other things that we are trying to attempt is to create simulators in which, can I get about five minutes more? Yeah. So if, uh, if you look at simulators which could simulate accident conditions, most of you who are drivers would know that you have actually never had a situation in which you were tested for an accident. You can't be, right? So you can only be tested for an accident if you were actually on a simulator. And if I could simulate all the conditions that normally would happen during an accident, then the driver's capability to deal with an accident would be far superior. And so that's one of those issues which technology could perhaps address till the time we have driver-driven cars. So these are some of the things that we have already got in place. This is a test track for a driver. The, what you see in the bottom is a simulator. And the test track actually certifies a driver automatically. The, uh, the entire thing is being mapped on a computer and the license comes out, uh, you, you are passed or failed on a computer printout. And this is already operational in Pune. Some of you who would ever want to come and check it out should actually visit and see it. Now, another challenge that we have today is very high fatalities for uh, on roads. And this is something which is definitely unacceptable. And so we have created a strategy to reduce accidents. We have established a lead agency in the transport department. We have created a dedicated road safety fund. We have a road safety engineering cell in the public works department to ensure that the road designs are appropriate. You have instructions for traffic calming measures and enforcement and emergency care for emergency care for accidents which have already taken place. We also do a complete analysis of the accident and this is the kind of app that we have created. In this app, all accident data is captured and we are hoping that we will be able to reduce the fatalities which are as high as 13,000 per annum, extremely unacceptable in a civilized world. This also, this data therefore gives you all the accident data points and the kind of stuff that we could do on those data points. Time of accident, severity of the injury, the status of the pavement, status of the lighting, and then the trauma care facility, where exactly it is, location of the patrolling team, service area, all that could be actually mapped and here we can also see which are the areas which are unserved and thereby impact them, which are the black spots, which are the spots which are accident prone, and create short-term measures and create long-term measures in terms of lighting, in terms of crash barriers, in terms of speed breakers, and of course the long-term measure of road improvement, emergency care, enforcement through better technology like cameras. Then the government of India has now come up with a new regulation which is about uh, VTS in all vehicles, which vehicle tracking system. We are trying to create a back end so that all the vehicles which are getting tracked across the state can actually be also looked at in terms of violation, in terms of transportation planning, vehicle health analysis, and the real time traffic analysis. So the vehicle tracking system should create enough data in the next about four or five years for us to be able to deal with that data, to, to be able to use that data effectively for better management. Each alarm, I mean, some of you must have got it. Those who haven't, hopefully you won't. <laughs> but this is another thing that has started happening there. Even e, uh, the PUC certificates are uploaded electronically now. And then this is that AI-based analytics in, in cities like Mumbai, Pune. We have enough cameras now, but gradually we'll move on to all the expressways. In fact, the ITMS, intelligent traffic management systems, are actually getting inbuilt in the expressways. We have one already from Mumbai to Pune, but the one which is coming from Mumbai to Nagpur, which is a much longer expressway, has much better systems which are embedded in the road itself, and therefore a lot of analysis could be done through that data. And 
use of blockchain, which will ensure that most of the data which is there is actually well protected. And each one in the scheme of things is actually aware of whatever data is being dealt with. And therefore, there is no tampering which would be possible. So the whole idea of blockchain would be that every one of us uploads the data that, is, that belongs to us so that no one can mess with it. And once you have uploaded the data, no one can change it easily without you actually having known it in advance. And most of you who are here are technology geeks, so you would know it better than I do as to how the blockchain technology works. And finally, I would say that with the IT revolution only in its infancy and about to revolutionize many industries, not just mobility, we are becoming aware of the potential impact on people's jobs and livelihoods. In fact, some estimates suggest that some 50 to 70% of all current jobs are at risk. The transport and logistics sectors is in many ways at the forefront. Truck drivers, car drivers, warehouse attendants, sailors, booking clerks, they're all going to become, maybe over time, risky professions to be in. And I'm saying this because those of you who are in the IT e-governance uh, domain need to start rethinking that if this is what is going to happen in 15, 20 years, then the technology that you are working on may not be relevant after 15, 20 years. So how does this all add up? Well, I can only imagine. Somebody just said the future, something about the future. I can only imagine a future that is dramatically different from that of today. And as William Gibson, the famous science fiction writer wrote, the future is already here. It is just that it is unevenly distributed. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing.